And welcome to God's Truth. I'm your instructor, Dr. D. Todd Harrison. We welcome you. This is the second round now of the uh, Come Follow Me. We've just spent the last four years looking at the Book of Mormon, followed by the Doctrine and Covenants, the Old and New Testaments. Uh, those of you who've been with us all along, we, we thank you. We uh, had no idea to what level this would go and how far this would go. When I saw the other day uh, the original video that we originally had uh, put out, in which we said that we had hoped that, you know, we'll see how this goes, right? Little did we know at that time, the marvelous power, the wondrous works of God, that he could take a humble person like I was four years ago and use me as an instrument in his hands to touch more than 80 million people throughout the world. We've seen thousands come into the waters of baptism, and take upon themselves the name of Jesus Christ, being baptized by those who hold the priesthood and authority of God. We have seen tens of thousands of people come into Jesus Christ for the first time in their entire lives, be touched by the Spirit of God, and to know that Christ's love, they have felt that for the first time in their lives through these videos, through the written posts that we've been putting out. What marvelous wonder and uh, what a Mars work and a wonder this is here in these latter days and this modern day technology that we have at our disposal. For those of you wondering, should we, if you've been with us since the beginning, should we do this again for, for Book of Mormon? You've got to remember how we teach these lessons. We, rely, we do the old fashioned way, the way that you should, the biblical way. We do everything we can to prepare spiritually for these lessons, but we take no thought beforehand what we should say or what we should speak instead we let the holy ghost be our teacher to speak through us to enlighten these passages i first read the chapters just simply after much prayer and spiritual preparation to write down the various verses and passages that that we that i feel that the spirit would have us look at and that's all i do then we come and we look at those passages and we let the Holy Ghost be our teacher to teach us, to prophesy through us, to lead to all kinds of wonderful, miraculous and spiritual instruction and touching the lives of millions throughout all the world. So it's what we're going to do now. All of us are in a different place now four years ago than we were four years ago. Four years ago, we were facing a pandemic in the beginning of the Book of Mormon. We were facing a pandemic of biblical proportions. There were a lot of prognosticators and people, prophet, you know, medical people saying how this was just going to, you know, pretty much wipe out the world. And we listened to the Spirit teach us through the Book of Mormon the extent to which the pandemic would affect the world, you know, approximately how many people would die when we would know uh, was the, the, the ending of the pandemic. We prophesied it would end the way it did and the miraculous way of the Lord. And so here we are four years later. And a lot of things have gone in the world, so we're all in a different place than we were four years ago. We all need different things now. And that's one of the great things of the scriptures is that, is that the Spirit of God is able to speak through the scriptures to us in every as we progress throughout our lives and experience different trials and afflictions. And what it will speak, what this... Uh, what the Lord will speak through his spirit to us in 2024 through the Book of Mormon, while we're looking at the same passages, will be different messages than they were four years ago in 2020. So, yes, we welcome you to come back the second round here. And we will, I'm, I'm sure I know God very well. We will be learning new things this year than we have in 2020. If you want to still watch those videos as well. You can go ahead and do that and compare and, and see what the difference. So as we begin today, we're looking at the Book of Mormon. Uh, I think last time was 1 Nephi 1 through 7. This time is 1 Nephi 1 through 5, so we're two chapters less. But those two short chapters, and we'll cover those, I'm sure, next week. As we always like to do and as we do in each of these videos, at least the past couple of years, we like to testify of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as one of his witnesses, I testify that he lives. 
He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He sits enthroned at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. He is our Lord, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Hero, our All. Let us worship this day through the study of his word, through the Book of Mormon, another testament of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and take out our Book of Mormons. And uh, for those of you, again, that who don't have a Book of Mormon and you live in countries where you don't have access to that, and keep in mind that you don't have to be a member of the church to watch these videos. We know that uh, this one broadcast is very unique. Uh, there's some uh, other people who do similar, um, you know, that teach similar topics as we do, and they come follow me. But we're the only one that that probably half or maybe even more of our audience are actually not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. So we continue to welcome you. Uh, a lot of you in countries where the, uh, uh, the, the this is outlawed. And there's no legal uh, way for us to currently have missionaries in your country. So. We know there's a lot of you that out there that are Protestant uh, pastors, and we continue to invite you what the Lord Jesus Christ would say to you if he were currently here, sitting here addressing you right now, and that is continue faithful in obeying his voice, keeping his commandments, and teaching your flocks, your congregations, the truth as you're learning it. Prepare their hearts so that when the day comes in which the Lord is able to get the missionaries into your countries, some of you that may not happen until the second coming, when the Lord personally comes to reign as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, may not happen till then, but you are to prepare your people to meet the Lord when he comes. Continue to be faithful and teach, him, teach them this word as found in the Book of Mormon. Another testament of Jesus Christ and what you learned from the Bible. You can go to churchofjesuschrist.org and you can download a copy of the Book of Mormon to follow along if you like to do that and don't have access to this book. Okay, well, let's look here at uh, First Nephi and uh, look at uh, 1 through 5 here today. Again, we've jotted down the passages and we're going to humble ourselves and listen carefully to what the Spirit has to say to us this day as we study His Word. We'll look at chapter 1, and we'll read first verses 1 through 15. Hopefully I can through the, <laughs> through the water currently in my eyes. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father, and having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record of my proceedings in my days. What a loaded passage of scripture that starts off with. Been born of goodly parents. Why were they good? They taught him the gospel of Jesus Christ. They also taught in basic subjects uh, like you would find in a school and, and so forth. They did their best to teach uh, Nephi and his brothers the Word of God as well as other academic pursuits as well. He saw many afflictions in the course of his days, but because he had a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because he understood what the per what the purposes of afflictions are to round and purge off the rough edges of us and to mold us into the image of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, he was able to go through these afflictions and handle these afflictions because of his testimony of the goodness of God. So he proceeds to make a proceedings of his days. Now, this is not just for Nephi or the prophets of the different books of Scripture. We've all been commanded to keep journals and record in them the things that God has done for us in our lives so that we know, and when we have a chance to read them and review them, we can see how faithful and how good Christ has been to us in our lives. Verse 2, Yea, I make a record in the language of my Father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. So 
We've been commanded to learn foreign languages, to, to learn different languages. He was, his father was familiar with the Egyptian language and with the um, Hebrew uh, language uh, from, from, the, from Jerusalem. Three, and I know that the record which I make is true. We are commanded to be truthful and faithful in our accounts and uh, re telling the events of our lives. And, uh, you know, and uh, so he's saying, now I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. What I write in here is the truth. And that's what we're commanded to do is tell the truth. Four, for it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, so about 600 B.C., my father Lehi, having dwelt at Jerusalem in all his days, and in that same year there came many prophets, and we know among them who include Jeremiah from the Old Testament, as well as Baruch. We know that there were other prophets there as well. Prophesying unto the people that they must repent, or the great city of Jerusalem must be destroyed. And that's going to be a big theme once again in the Book of Mormon this year, that God demands that we repent of our sins and change the course of our life. If we don't, ultimately his patience runs out and he has to destroy that city, that country, that civilization. History is full of many, many recordings of these events in which the civilizations were wiped out when they turned away from God. Verse 5, Wherefore it came to pass that my father Lehi, as he went forth, prayed unto the Lord, yea, even with all his heart, in behalf of his people. And it came to pass, as he prayed unto the Lord, there came a pillar of fire and dwelt. Now, dwelt is the same Semitic word being used here as to sit. So to sit, to dwell, this pillar of fire, this pillar, physical object pillar, comes down. It has lights, has the glory of God. Therefore, it looked like fire to him. So this object that was looked like it was on fire due to the glory of God came down, dwelt on the rock. We looked at it all the way through the Old Testament, the New Testament. Once again here, it's just incredible. In, 18, in 1830, when the Book of Mormon was published, look at that. It fits exactly that biblical model. Those of you who are with us in the Old and New Testaments saw dozens of these examples of these UAP or UFO type of objects that God uses and his angels use. Joseph Smith, you know, people, even today, they want to try to say that he made this stuff up. There is no way he could be that consistent. 1830, they still didn't know. No one was talking about UFOs and UAP. No one even knew what an airplane was. They hadn't been invented yet. Nobody knew about helicopters or all these things. So once again, Joseph Smith, yeah, he would have had to got that right. How well did could someone? No one, no one could humanly know the biblical record that well to get all the details always one hundred percent consistent. The pillar, it was a physical object. These UAP came down, dwelt on the rock, just as Moses saw in the burning bush. Remember, see something and God speaks out of it, but yet the bush. Is it burned because it wasn't a real fire? It was the light of God, right? And therefore, it did not burn the bush. It was not a fire. That's just how Moses had to describe it. He doesn't have the vocabulary uh, to use. We've seen this example over and over again, all the way through the Old Testaments and the New Testaments. And it's exactly you would expect to find that here. If the Old and New Testament is full of UAP reports, and it's one of the major, most frequent events in the scripture, in the Old and New Testament. You would expect to find that in the Book of Mormon, and right away, right away we get it here with the pillar. He didn't. He didn't say a fire came down and 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 hit a rock. No, a pillar. When they when these when they use the word pillar, you have to pay attention. A pillar is a physical object, guys. Physical object full of the light of God. Looked like a fire came down, dwelt or sat upon the rock without burning it, right? <laughs> it's a, it is a physical object. It's not going to burn, you know, or, or anything like that, right? He says here, And it came a pillar of fire dwelt upon a rock before him, and he saw and heard much. And because of the things which he saw and heard, he did quake and tremble exceedingly. 
And it came to pass that he returned to his own house at Jerusalem, and he cast himself upon his bed, being overcome with the Spirit, and of the things which he had seen. And being thus overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he what? Wow, look at this. We just saw this in the past in the past few weeks in the book of Revelation, didn't we? John saw the same thing, saw the heavens open. Now this is, you know, some have suggested that maybe this is a, uh, some sort of, um, uh, you know, it's some sort of, uh, you know, the, um, well, excuse me about that uh, noise there. Um, but uh, at any rate, it looks like just like John in the book of Revelation is seeing this this vision open up. Uh, he's seen, you know, basically uh, some sort of wormhole opening up that then opens up the way into heaven. That's what John talks about in the book of Revelation. I've seen this thing, um, uh, you know, I've seen the heavens open, right? And so here once again, uh, Lehi sees the exact same thing. See the heavens open. Exactly. These are just the very fine details of the biblical text that few people reading even pay attention to or even know about. But once again, the Book of Mormon is absolutely consistent with that of the heavens opening. Okay. And so he's, uh, uh, and he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded by numberless concourses of angels. And the attitude, attitude of singing and praising got just exactly like John saw in the book of Revelation. And it came to pass that he saw one descending out of the midst of heaven. And he beheld that his luster was above that of the sun at noonday. And he also saw 12 others following him, the 12 apostles of Jesus following Jesus. And their brightness did exceed that of the stars in the firmament. And they came down and went up forth upon the face of the earth. And the first came and stood before my father and gave unto him a book and bade him that he should read. And it came to pass that as he read, he was filled with the spirit of the Lord. What's one of the fastest ways to be filled with the spirit of the Lord? You open the book, you open the scriptures, you open the, the Bible or the Book of Mormon and you start reading and you can become filled with the Holy Spirit as well. One of the fastest ways to get the spirit Open the book and just start to read. And he read, saying, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem, for I have seen thy abominations, yea, and many things did my father read concerning Jerusalem, that it should be destroyed, and the inhabitants thereof. Many should perish by the sword, and many should be carried away captive into Babylon. Just as many of the prophets in the Old Testament had testified that the people rejected the Lord from their lives, God would destroy Jerusalem. Here, Lehi is being told the same message from reading the book of Scripture. And it came to pass that when my father had read and seen many great and marvelous things, he did exclaim many things unto the Lord, such as great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Thy throne is high in the heavens, and thy power and goodness and mercy are all over the inhabitants of the earth. And because thou art merciful, thou wilt not suffer those who come unto thee that they shall perish. He doesn't turn anyone back. He stands at the door and knocks. He's asking and continually inviting you to open the door and let him come in and be with you. If you turn to him through his mercy, he will not forsake you or turn you away. We saw that with the mortal uh, Jesus Christ when he was the mortal Messiah. And he was sent to the, to the house of Israel. But the Gentile woman approached him, didn't she? And she begged him to please heal her daughter. He said, I only came to the house of Israel at this time. It's not given to the Gentiles yet to have the gospel and the blessings of the gospel. But she continued to ask him for his mercy. And then it says that what? He became merciful towards her and healed her daughter. Just as that example, so this doctrinal teaching here, he will not turn you away. Well, thou will not suffer those who come unto thee, that they shall perish. And after this manner was the language of my father in the praising of his God, where his soul did rejoice, and his whole heart was filled, because of the things which he had seen, yea, which the Lord had shown unto him. And so we ought to rejoice and have our hearts full 
when we see these things by reading the scriptures, hearing the words of living apostles and prophets of God. Okay, now we'll look at 18 through 20. It says, Therefore I would that ye should know that after the Lord had shown so many marvelous things unto my father Lehi, yea, concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, behold, he went forth among the people and began to prophesy and declare unto them concerning the things which he had both seen and heard. Now notice, he didn't wait to be called. They didn't ask him to. They didn't say, hey, now that you know this, go preach this. God often has to tell people and command them, right? He didn't have to command Lehi. People who are truly converted unto the Lord go out and, and share the good news of the gospel and share the war about the warnings and uh, coming judgments of God upon the world because of their love towards the Savior and their love towards mankind. 19. And it came to pass that the Jews did mock him because of the things which he testified of them. For he truly testified of their wickedness and their abominations, and he testified of the things which he saw and heard, and also the things which he read in the book manifested plainly of the coming of a Messiah and also the redemption of the world. Jesus was going to come. It was always prophesied throughout all the Old Testament the prophecies of that coming event. And when the Jews heard these things, they were angry with him, yea, even as with the prophets of old, whom they had cast out and stoned and slain. And they also sought his life, just as they killed them, that they might take it away. But behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are all over those whom he had chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. So there's two thoughts here. So number one, that um, there are some that were foreordained to die as Christian martyrs. We see that we saw that in the book of Revelation, that God knew exactly the number. And the, and the souls of those who had been slain were crying under the altar of the heavenly temple, under the altar in the heavenly temple, begging for God to avenge their blood on the world. And he said that he couldn't until the, the number had been set for the Christian, for the total number of Christian martyrs. So on the one hand, that. On the other hand, what we're being told here is that there are some people who have been persecuted, and, and, um, and uh, but they didn't have the deliverance simply because of their faith. Later, we're going to see uh, other uh, examples here of what happens to some of these guys in the Book of Mormon who had the faith to be delivered, and they're going to be delivered because of their faith. Now we move on to chapter 2. And let's look at verses 1 through 2. For behold, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto my father, yea, even in a dream. Now, why is he telling this? Remember, we looked at this model, model all the way through the Old and New Testaments, that the qualifications to be a prophet is to what? To see the Lord in a dream, according to Numbers 12, 6. So maybe uh, in different churches, uh, different, uh, maybe people that have a some sort of... Uh, position in their church as a prophet, uh, maybe as an apostle, but, uh, you know, in a, as a prophet. Uh, but unless they've seen Jesus in a dream, according to the biblical uh, model in Numbers 12, 6, and according to what we're seeing here, they are not a prophet, right? They, they, they may have a position of that in their church, but unless they've seen the Lord in a dream, they are not uh, qualified as a prophet according to the biblical Model, so that's why Nephi wants to let you know that he saw the Lord in a dream, saying, "Hey, my dad was a prophet, according to the Mosaic law in Numbers twelve six. He saw the Lord in a dream, and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Lehi, because of the things which thou hast done, and because thou hast been faithful and declared unto this people the things which I commanded thee. Behold, they seek to take away thy life. And it came to pass that the Lord commanded my father, even in a dream." that he should take his family and depart into the wilderness. So I command you, get out of Jerusalem. They're going to kill you, Lehi. Take your family out of here. I'm going to take you to a promised land. Six through seven. And it came to pass when he had traveled three days in the wilderness, he pitched his tent in the valley by the side of a river. And it came to pass that he built an altar of stones and made an offering unto the Lord and gave thanks unto the Lord 
our God. You worship the Lord wherever you are. In the, in the ancient uh, Jewish religion, they believed that you could only worship the Lord in Jerusalem. Even the days of Jesus, they thought that. Remember, Jesus had that uh, meeting at the well with the uh, Samaritan woman in which he tried to explain that, no, you don't have to only worship the Lord here you know, in, in Jerusalem or even on the mount where your people worship God. You know, you worship God basically wherever you are. So that's what Lehi is doing here. 9 through 10. And when my father saw that the waters of the river emptied into the fountain of the Red Sea, he spake unto Laman, saying, All that thou mightest be like unto this river, continually running into the fountain of all righteousness. And also he spake unto Lamuel, O oh, that thou mightest be like unto this valley, firm and steadfast and immovable, and keeping the commandments of the Lord. Now this he spake because of the stiff nakedness of Laman and Lamuel. For behold, they did murmur in many things against their father, because he was a visionary man. That's mocking, right? They thought he was a visionary man. He's having all these visions. And he had led them out of the land of Jerusalem to leave the land of their inheritance and their gold and their silver and their precious things to perish in the wilderness. And this they said he had done because of the foolish imaginations of his heart. 12. And thus Laman and Lemuel, being the eldest, did murmur against their father, and they did murmur because they knew not the dealings of that God who had created them. Who's the only one that complains? Those who don't understand the ways of the Lord. Who don't understand what God is doing in your lives through the trials and the tribulations and the afflictions. Those who, who do understand it, they can be like Nephi, as we saw earlier in chapter 1. And they can still have an enjoyable, uh, peaceful, life full of happiness and joy, even in the midst of affliction because of their knowledge of the goodness of God and knowing about these things. 13. 13, right? 13. Neither did they believe that Jerusalem, that great city, could be destroyed according to the words of the prophets. A lot of the people thought they can't destroy Jerusalem because of the temple. As long as the temple's standing, God will protect Jerusalem. It will not fall. So they didn't believe that. Earlier in 605 BC, the first deportation came. Uh, when the king of the Babylon uh, of Babylon came, and they took Daniel and you know, remember, and, and the three and the three as well, and uh, many other Jewish uh, nobles off the Babylon, but they were they didn't conquer the city at that time. So they're thinking, well, we saw they came, they took some of us hostage and took some of us off the Babylon, but they can't destroy Jerusalem because the temple is there. It's telling in one of the books of Baruch. Uh, before the, the night before the temple's destroyed, he's sitting up on a hill and, and he's uh, and he overlooks Jerusalem and he sees the Spirit of God up, go up from the temple up into the heavens, and then the, and then the Babylonians were able to come destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple. In verse um, fourteen. And it came to pass that my father did speak unto them in the valley of Lemuel with power, being filled with the Spirit, until their frames did shake before him. And they did confound them, that they durst not utter against him, wherefore they did as he commanded them. And 16 through 17. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, being exceedingly young, Nevertheless, being large in statue, and also having great desires to know the mysteries of God. Wherefore, I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me. If you truly want to know. There's some that think, well, if God lived, why doesn't he just appear to me? Well, there's a problem with that, right? Is that you don't have the sincerity like Nephi did, having the great desires to know the mysteries of God. Two, when God appears to you, there's a covenant made. The covenant between you and the Lord now is that you're going to spend the rest of your life going forth to teach and to testify and bear your witness of the Lord. So don't just think that it would be a great thing if God just appeared to you and you would know once and for all that God lives. No, there comes an awesome responsibility 
behind such a thing that requires you dedicating the rest of your life to serving him. I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me, and did soften my heart, that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father, wherefore I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. And I spake unto Sam, making known to him the things. See, true conversion. True con converts go out and teach their family and their neighbors and whoever they can. And I spake unto Sam, making known unto him the things which the Lord had manifested unto me by his Holy Spirit. And it came to pass that he believed in my words. 18. But behold, Laman and Lemuel would not hearken unto my words, and being grieved because of the hardness of their hearts, I cried unto the Lord for them. 19 through 24. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Blessed art thou, Nephi, because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently with lowliness of heart. And inasmuch as you shall keep my commandments, you shall prosper. You want to prosper? You want to have a good life? You keep you keep the commandments. God has said that in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, everywhere he's spoken in Scripture. He has told that promise over and over again. You shall prosper, and you shall be led to a land of promise. Now, in this case, he's specifically talking about the American continent and giving them over the ocean here to the American continent. But to all of us, he speaks to us of the land of promise, the true land of promise, which would be the celestial kingdom with God, our eternal Father. We shall be led to the celestial kingdom, the true land of promise, as we keep his commandments. Yea, even a land which I have prepared for you. Yea, a land which is choice above all other lands. Paul described the celestial glory as what no eye has seen, neither ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them who love him. And inasmuch as thy brethren shall rebel against thee, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And inasmuch as thou shalt keep my commandments, thou shalt be made a ruler and a teacher over thy brethren. For behold, in that day that they shall rebel against me, I will curse them, even with a sore curse, and they shall have no power over thy seed, except thy seed shall rebel against me also. We saw this many times as well in the first four years, right? This idea, this the false idea spread throughout the world that, well, it's okay, you know, I don't need the blessing. I don't need a blessing of God. Therefore, I don't really need to obey him, keep his commands, because... No, that's fine with me. I, I just won't get the blessing. But you don't understand, it's not, there's no neutrality. You're either blessed or cursed, life or death, blessing or cursing. It's one or the other. There's no neutrality. So those who rebel against me, I will curse. And if it so be that thy seed, that, 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 if it so be that thy seed, Nephi, rebel against me, they shall be a scourge unto thy seed, to steer them up in the remember in the ways of remembrance. There's greater punishment for those who converted to the gospel than for those who never did convert to the gospel and then fell away. So once you've made serious covenants with God, he, hold, he holds you to them, and you need to make sure you keep your covenants and do your best to follow him and keep his, his commandments, and, and, and he'll bless you. But if you don't and you turn against him after making those covenants, you're going to be more cursed than those who never did make those covenants in the first place. There he's saying that thy brethren, that he's foretelling the future Lamanites, will have power over thy seed when they don't keep the commandments. Chapter 3, look at verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, returned from speaking with the Lord to the tent of my father. And it came to pass that he spake unto me, saying, Behold, I have dreamed a dream. And the which the Lord hath commanded me that thou, my brother, shall return to Jerusalem. For behold, Laban hath the record of the Jews and also the genealogy of my forefathers, and they're graven upon the plates of brass. Wherefore the Lord hath commanded me that thou and thy brother should go into the house of Laban and seek the records and bring them down hither into the wilderness. And now behold, thy brothers murmur, saying, It is a hard thing which I have required of them. But behold, I am not required it. Of them, it is a commandment of the Lord, and that's true 
priesthood leadership. That's true leadership. And when you ask people to do assignments, to do different callings, that you obtain that from the Lord. So they can't, just like Nephi here, it's, but it is a command, just like Lehi here, right? But it's a command of, of the Lord. I'm not asking you to do this. The Lord is commanding you and asking you to do this. I'm just the person giving the invitation to fulfill that calling. And then we'll look at um, six. Therefore, go, my son, and thou shalt be favored of the Lord, because thou hast not murmured. Boy, we're starting to get the indication here that the Lord does not like people murmuring, does he? He doesn't bless murmurs. He blesses those who learn to not murmur in their trials and afflictions and their course of life. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord will not give, will give no commandments unto the children of man, so he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. He's not going to just ask you to do something that's not even possible to do. Everything he tells you to do, he knows is possible, and he will help you to accomplish it. And it came to pass that when my father had heard these words, he was exceedingly glad, for he knew that I had been blessed of the Lord. And 10 through 11. And it came to pass that when we had gone up to the land of Jerusalem, I and my brother did consult one with another. And we cast lots, who of us should go into the house of Laban. They were big into this, the ancient Jews. They believed that God would, if they cast lots, that God would make sure that the, you know, that the one he wanted really would be picked, right? And they did this to, to choose the new apostle in the beginning of Acts. They drew lots to see who God wanted to be the new apostle. So here they're casting lots to see who gets to be the one to go in and ask Laban for the place. And Laman gets to be the winner here. We'll look at 12. And he desired to Laban the records which were graven upon the plates of brass which contained the genealogy of my father. And behold, it came to pass that Laban was angry and thrust him out from his presence. And he would not that we should have the records. Wherefore he said unto him, Behold, thou art a robber, and I will kill you. I will slay you. But the layman fled out of the, his presence and told the things which Laban had done unto us. And we began to be exceedingly sorrowful, and my brethren were about to return unto the, my father in the wilderness. But behold, I say unto them, that is the Lord liveth, and as we live, we will not go down into our father's wilderness until we have accomplished the thing which the Lord hath commanded us. Now that's showing real faith, right? Wherefore, let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, let us go down to the land of our father's inheritance, for behold, he left gold and silver and all manner of riches. And this he had done because of the commandments of the Lord. For he knew that Jerusalem must be destroyed because of the wickedness of the people. For behold, they have rejected the words of the prophets. Wherefore, if my father should dwell in the land, after he had been commanded to flee out of the land, behold, he would have also perish, Lehi would have died. Well, for it must needs be that he flee out of the land. And behold, it is wisdom in God that we should obtain these records, that we may preserve unto our children the language of our Father, and also that we may preserve unto them the words which have been spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets, which have been delivered unto them by the Spirit and power of God since the world began even down to the present time. And it came to pass that after this manner of language did I persuade my brethren that they might be faithful in keeping the commandments of God. Okay, so then in uh, 22, it came to pass that we went down to the land of our inheritance and they gathered together their gold and their silver, precious things. They go back to give it to, to Laban and Laban the kids them being robbers, he chases them out of the, you know, chases them out of there. And so then they were all angry. Let's see. So then in verse then of verse 26, and it fell into the hands of Laban. And it came to pass that we fled into the wilderness, and the servants of Laban did not overtake us. 
and we hid ourselves in the cavity of a rock. And it came to pass that Laman was angry with me, and also with my father, and also with Lemuel, for he hearkened unto the words of Laman. But for Laman and Lemuel did speak many hard words unto us, their younger brothers, and they did smite us even with a rod. And it came to pass as they smote us with a rod. Behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before them. Right? He started to hit the Lord's anointed. And they're watching, right? The angels are watching. The Lord came and stood before, an angel of the Lord came and stood before them, and he spake unto them, saying, Why do you smite your younger brother with a rod? Know ye not that the Lord had chosen him to be ruler over you? And this because of your iniquities? Behold, you should go up to Jerusalem again, and the Lord will deliver Laban into your hands. And after the angel had spoken unto us, he departed. And after the angel had departed, Laman and Lemuel arose again, again began to murmur, saying, How is it possible that the Lord will deliver Laban into our hands? Behold, he is a mighty man, and he can command fifty, yea, even he can slay fifty. Then why not us? Right? So we're, we're worried here about that. We now move to chapter 4, and we'll look at verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass that I spake unto my brethren, saying, Let us go up again into Jerusalem, and let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. For behold, he is mightier than all the earth, then why not make mightier than Laban and his fifty, yea, or even his tens of thousands? Even if Laban had more than fifty, even if Laban had tens of thousands, the Lord God is the Lord of hosts. He is over all the armies of heaven. He is no match for our Lord. Therefore, let us go up, let us be strong like unto Moses, for he truly spake unto the waters of the Red Sea. And they divided hither and thither, and our fathers came through out of captivity on dry ground. And the armies of Pharaoh did follow were drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. Now behold, ye know that this is true, and ye also know that an angel has spoken unto you. Wherefore, how can you doubt? Even an angel just came down from heaven to tell you. Let us go up. The Lord is able to deliver us even as our fathers and to destroy Laban as the Egyptians. Look at six. And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. And that's how we should go through our lives. Being led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand what what we should do, what we should teach, or what we should speak about, you know, the, the, all these sort of ideas. That's how you're supposed to live your life, right? Now he's setting this up also according to Messiah law. And what happens if a you know bad robber or bad person if the Lord delivers them to you, right? If you're thinking uh, premeditated uh, about I want to kill this guy, and then you do, now that's murder, right? But if you're not thinking about it, killing somebody that's evil, and the Lord delivers him into your hands, now you can kill him and you're not guilty according to the law. So he's setting that up about what's going to happen next. And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. Nevertheless, I went forth, and as I came near unto the house of Laban, I beheld a man. And he had fallen to the earth before me, for he was drunk with wine. When I came to him, I found that it was Laban. And I beheld a sword, and I drew it forth from the sheep thereof. And the hilt thereof was of pure gold, and the workmanship thereof was exceedingly fine. And I saw that the blade thereof was of the most precious steel. And it came to pass that I was constrained by the Spirit that I should kill Laban. But I hadn't thought about killing Laban before. The Spirit's telling me. So again, he's exactly in accordance with keeping the law of Moses here. But I said in my heart, never at any time have I shed the blood of man. And I shrunk in wood that I might not slay him. So what happens? The Spirit says unto me again, Behold, the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. So you know, this is fulfilled the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. You're okay, Nephi, to kill him. Yea, and I also knew that he had sought to take away mine own life. Yea, and he would not hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. And he also had taken away our property. So a guilty, guilty of theft. Right? And a guilty of potential murder. And it came to pass that the Spirit said unto me again, Slay him, for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hand. So the Spirit has to tell him twice now to do this and remind him about the scripture in the book of Numbers that he's okay to go ahead and kill him according to the law of Moses. 
14. And now when, uh, let's see, verse, uh, verse 13. Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purpose. Now he also often will slay the righteous to bring forth his righteous purposes. Uh, it's better that one man die for uh, die than that the whole nation do unto an unbelief. It said that even at Jesus, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, trial, right? So it's better one man should perish than the whole nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. It said also at Jesus' trial by the high priest, and they said he fulfilled prophecy by saying that, and he didn't even know that that applied to Jesus. And now when I, Nephi, had heard these words, I remembered the words of the Lord, which he spake unto me in the wilderness, saying that inasmuch as I see shall keep my commands, always conditional, they shall prosper in the land of promise. And I also thought that they could not keep the commandments of the Lord according to the law of Moses, say they should have the law. How are you going to keep the law of Moses, all 613 commandments, if they don't have those 613 uh, commandments, right? The law of Moses, 613 commandments. They're living the law of Moses because Christ has not yet come, right? So they have to live 613 commandments. How are they going to live those without having access to the records? And I also knew that the law was engraven upon the plates of brass. And again, I knew that the Lord had delivered Laban into my hands for this cause, that I might obtain the records according to his commandments. 18. Therefore I did obey the voice of the Spirit and took Laban by the hair of the head, and I smote, smote off his head with his own sword. And after I had smitten off his head with his own sword, I took the garments of Laban and put them on me. Right? So now he's pretending to be Laban. He goes and he finds Zoram, his, uh, his right-hand guy. Uh, he asks Zoram to show him where the records are. He gets the records. He tells Zoram to come with him. He starts to leave the city of Jerusalem. So and it starts to realize, hey, wait a minute, something fishy going on here, right? And the brothers see Nephi, and they go running for their lives until he cries out that he is Nephi. So 33 through 35. And I spake unto him even with an oath that he need not fear, that he should be a free man. So servant and slave were often interchangeable terms in, in, the, in, the ancient, in ancient Israel, right? So. Uh, what he's saying here is that uh, uh, it's an it's a interchangeable, a lot of technical difficulties here tonight. Uh, here. Seems to be, uh, we have lost it. Well, one moment, I hope you're still with me. Oh, here we go. That's again proof we don't edit these videos, but we uh, do our best here to speak by the Spirit. And you see the, the, the uh, and you see the distractions that Satan often will put up when people preach the Word of God by the Spirit of God. It is at uh, four eighteen in the morning where I'm located now. Four eighteen in the morning. You've heard the phone ringing. Uh, who receives phone calls at 4.18 in the morning, right? And now we just had some sort of technical difficulty. It looked like I, I lost the whole uh, uh, this whole video here, but luckily it looks like we've got it going here again. And uh, we'll continue on now um, with this. And uh, let's see if we can. In 30, it was 33 through 35, I believe. And I speak unto him, even with an oath, that he need not fear that he should be a free man. All right, no longer be, you don't have to be a slave anymore, Zoram. If you come with us, you're going to be free just like we're free. If you go down in the wilderness with us, and I also speak unto him. Now, if he goes back, right, and they, you know, has to tell him that, well, I just had somebody, well, first of all, we find, we find that Laban's been killed. Now he says, well, I found something, the, the, the murderer, uh, and he dressed up as Laban, and he, Got, and he also stole the plates from us too. So he killed Laban and stole the plate. And I wasn't able to do anything about it. They really fooled me, right? Well, they're probably going to kill Zoram, right? So he goes back. He's going to be killed. Um, 
if he uh, tries to go back, the brothers are you're going to be scared here. They're, they're probably going to have to be forced to kill him. Now Nephi's having to kill another guy. <laughs> you know, so it's a tough kind of tough situation. But the offer was freedom, right? Freedom to Zoram. And so Zoram takes the offer here. And I also spake unto him, saying, Surely the Lord hath commanded us to do this thing, and shall we not be diligent in keeping the commandments of the Lord? Therefore thou wilt go down into the wilderness to my father, thou shalt, thou shalt have place with us. And it came to pass that Zoram did take courage at the words which I spake. Now Zoram was the name of the servant, and he promised that he would go down into the wilderness unto our father. Yea, and he also made an oath unto us that he would tarry with us from that time so they're going to feel relaxed now. Zoram made an oath in ancient cultures. Uh, their, uh, their oath was their word. It was, was everything. If they would rather die than to break their oath. So once he made the oath that he'll go down there uh, to his father, they don't have to worry about Zoram any longer. They get full. Uh, he ends up getting full adoption by Lehi. He has his own tribe uh, legally. Uh, recognized uh, along with the Nephites and the Lamanites and the Lemuelites, and uh, you get the uh, uh, Zoramites, right? So pretty powerful what, what happened here. Okay, so now we move to chapter 5. Chapter 5, 1 through 9, And it came to pass that after we had come down into the wilderness and to our father, and behold, he was filled with joy, and also my mother, Sariah, was exceedingly glad, for she truly had mourned because of us. She didn't trust in the Lord, did she? For she had supposed that we had perished in the wilderness. And she also had complained against my father, telling him that he was a visionary man. So again, mocking him. Hey, you just pretend to have all these visions. Or maybe you're just seeing things and have some sort of mental illness. Saying, Behold, thou hast led us forth from the land of our inheritance, and my sons are no more, and we're going to perish now here in the wilderness. And after this matter, language had my mother complained against my father. And it came to pass that my father spake unto her, saying, I know that I am a visionary man. I really know that I really am a visionary man. For if I had not seen the things of God that I saw in the vision, I should not have known the goodness of God. But it, we would have stayed at Jerusalem, and we would have perished with my brother there. But behold, I have obtained the land of promise, in the which things I do rejoice, yea, and I know that the Lord will deliver my sons out of the hands of Laban. See the difference between faith and, and, and non-faith, between him and his wife here, once full of faith, and so the things that he says are based on that faith. She does not have faith. She's complaining and saying things that doesn't uh, not in accord with those who, who believe, but it's in accord with her unbelief. And I know that the Lord will deliver my sons out of the hands of Laban and bring them down again into this wilderness. And after this manner language did my father Lehi comfort my mother Sariah concerning us while we journeyed in the wilderness up to the land of Jerusalem to obtain the record of the Jews. And when we had returned to the tent of my father, behold, their joy was full, and my mother was comforted. And she spake, and she spake saying, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. Yea, and I also know of a surety that the Lord hath protected my sons and delivered them out of the hands of Laban and given them power whereby they could accomplish the thing which the Lord hath commanded them. And after this manner language did she speak. Sounds, sounds much better now, doesn't it? And it came to pass that they did rejoice exceedingly and did offer sacrifice and burnt offerings unto the Lord, and they gave thanks unto the God of Israel. 10 through 13. And after they had given thanks unto the God of Israel, my father Lehi took the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass, and he did search them from the beginning. And that's how we should search the scriptures. We don't just pull up one scripture in the middle, take it out of context, and then try to live your life based on that scripture. No, you start from the beginning of the scriptures, and you study and you read all the way through the scriptures. Then you have a complete and more understanding of what's really going on with the dealings of God in the world. And now he's dealing with you in, in your life. And the joke is always that there was a depressed person and, and they were thinking about, uh, you know, just really depressed one day. And 
So they decided they're going to just open the Bible at random and get a word from the Lord. So they opened up the scripture and they read the one from the New Testament. Then Judas went out and hung himself. So here's just the present person. He opens up the scripture. Judas went out and hung himself. So he thought, well, uh, that's not quite right. We better, we better try this again. So he closes the Bible. He opens it up and he reads the verse of scripture. Go thou and do likewise, right? You can't take scriptures out of context. They're not meant to be that way. That only leads to confusion. That's what's led to all the different uh, sects of Christianity uh, rather than a unified Christian church. And then we would look here uh, from the beginning and verse 11. And beheld, and, and beheld that he did, that, that they did, contain the five books of Moses, Ex uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were complete before 600 B.C. Some scholars say it's late production in Babylon, a little bit later than that when they go off the Babylonian captivity. But no, we see that here. There was the five books of Moses in existence prior to 600 B.C. They gave an account of the creation of the world. We read that. In Genesis 1 and 2. And also of Adam and Eve. We read about them in chapter 2 of Genesis. Who were our first parents. And also a record of the Jews from the beginning. Even down to the commencement of the reign. Reign of Zedekiah king of Judah. And also the prophecies of the holy prophets from the beginning. Even down to the commencement of the reign of Zedekiah. And also many prophecies which have been spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah. They even had the prophecy of Jeremiah. Who was still alive and prophesying against them at this point in history. So pretty amazing that they truly did recognize Jeremiah as a prophet and were keeping records of his prophecies. Excuse me. And we'll look at the final... Five verses here, starting in, in uh, verse 17. And now when my father saw all these things, he was filled with the Spirit and began the prophecy the prophesy concerning his seed. So once again, that's the second time now. The Book of Mormon has already told us that how does one get filled with the Spirit of God? You read the Scriptures. Right? You, get, you read the Scripture. Not only get filled with the Spirit, but then you can even prophesy. Those who read the scriptures the most and have a strong testimony of Jesus Christ, which according to the book of Revelation, there's a spirit of prophecy, will be able to prophesy, and, and they do prophesy most frequently. <coughs> 18. And these plates of brass should go forth unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people who were of his seed. Now, there's two interpretations here. Number one, you can look at this. It's possible that the actual brass plates, that one day in the future, we're going to make a copy of them and send them out to the world. Or what Lehi is talking about here, <coughs> and it's not clear. Lehi may be trying to say that a record similar to what was on the brass plates, the Holy Bible, would go forth to all the uh, kindreds, tongues, and people who were of his uh, seed and that indeed has happened that has been fulfilled that would be fulfilled prophecy but if you saying that is similar then what do we see here these books of moses genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy are very similar to what was on the brass plates or he wouldn't have made he would not have made that comment if they were quite different uh, if the books said quite different things so the five books of moses as we've received through tradition and passed down over the centuries was different than the ones on the brass plate. He wouldn't have said what he said here. <clears throat> 19. Wherefore he said that these plates of brass should never perish, neither should they be dimmed any more by time. And he prophesied many things concerning his seed. And it came to pass that thus far I and my father had kept the commandments where what the Lord had commanded us. What a great and powerful thing it is to be able to declare that about you, about your life, that you have kept the commandments. What a powerful thing. May we all live in such a way, in such a fashion, that we may be able to say the same thing 
say the same thing as Nephi just did here, that we have kept the commandments of God. 21, and when and we had obtained the records which the Lord had commanded us and searched them and found out that they were desirable. And that is the promise to you. As you read the scriptures, you will come to find that they are desirable unto you. Yet even of great worth unto us, insomuch that we can pre preserve the commandments of the Lord unto our children. Wherefore it was wisdom in the Lord that we should carry them with us as we journeyed in the wilderness toward the land of promise. So again, focus on the importance of the Holy Scriptures. What a great day this has been. What a great uh, start off to the year 2024 and doing the Book of Mormon this year. I, you know, I'm trying to remember what it was like four years ago, but I, it seems to be we probably covered different topics and said quite a bit different things than we did in that original lesson. God has blessed us here again today, speaking to us through his Holy Spirit. We've learned many great things and learned many important lessons. So my prayer will take the things that you've learned this day, go forth in your life so that you can continue to experience this happiness and this joy and contentment that you get as one studies the scriptures and does their best to keep the commandments of God. Now, for those of you who are not yet members of the Church of Jesus Christ, Jesus has invited you over and over again. He has sent forth his missionaries by the tens of thousands throughout the world to try to get to your place, to your own house and to your own city and village to offer you the chance to accept him, to repent of your sins, to be baptized by those who hold the priesthood and authority of God, to then receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, to be your constant companion and lead you back on the path back to our Heavenly Father's presence. We invite you. We will leave in the description of this video a link. Click on that link. Let the missionaries of this church know that you're ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and exercise faith in him to repent of your sins and be baptized by those who hold the praise and authority of God. God will bless you greater than you've ever imagined if you will do these simple things and continue faithful to him. God will lead you to your promised land in the celestial kingdom on high. For those of you found in activity in the church, we welcome you with full open arms to come on back. Come on back and be part once again of the saints of God. You know how happy you were before you drifted away. Come back to that same joy, that same peace, that same commitment, that same contentment. Closing, we lay and we bless you in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. That you shall have food to eat, clean water to drink. That you shall have safe shelter overhead that you will have the basic monetary resources that you need to carry out God's will for your life and continue on the path that he has set for you. Know of a surety that God lives. He is your Heavenly Father. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. He knows what's best for you. The Lord Jesus Christ is his Son. He is our Savior and our Redeemer. He has made repentance possible. He has made salvation possible. He has made it possible for us to walk back to our Heavenly Father's presence. We love Him. We do our best to serve Him. Of Him we testify this day to the whole world that He indeed lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Till next time.